This is Indian, is Indian Country Today. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. The Indian Country Today headlines for April 17th. The state of Oklahoma and five of the state's tribes have reached an agreement to work together on jurisdictional issues. This comes a week after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Muscogee Creek Nation on the reservation status of lands in the eastern part of the state. Republican Attorney General Mike Hunter reached the accord with leaders of the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Muscogee Creek, and Seminole Nations that any proposed legislation should recognize tribal sovereignty and the respective tribal boundaries outlined in their treaties with the federal government. Muscogee Creek Nation Principal Chief David Hill said, Tribal nations have successfully collaborated with law enforcement for years in the communities we share, and this ruling only strengthens our ability to work together for the betterment of public safety for all Oklahomans. Protesters gathered in front of the Massachusetts State House Thursday, supporting legislation to ban the use of mascots and change the state's official seal. Hartman Dietz, a member of the Mashpee Wapanog tribe, said the state seal is a symbol of white supremacy because it references the defeat of local tribes at the hands of English colonists during the bloody battle of the century ago. The emblem depicts a Native American man, a colonist's arm brandishing a sword, and a Latin phrase that reads in part, by the sword, we shall seek peace. A dam removal is underway in Washington after decades of efforts by tribes. On Monday, construction crews began blasting the middle fork of the Nooksuck Dam just east of Bellingham. The Nooksuck Indian Tribe and Lummi Nation worked with conservation organizations and the local state government to restore the area. According to the Nooksuck's Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, Trevor Delgado, the tribe has always been against the dam. He said elders felt highly disrespected when it was built in 1961 because the area is part of who they are and was a safe place for them to practice their rights. Delgado said, we want to see the salmon return and continue protecting a resource that has always been there for our people. We want to continue to pass on the bridge from our ancestors into the future. The 1855 Point Elliott Treaty confirmed fishing and hunting rights for tribes, but they had to go to court to quantify those rights. And that led to a generation of co-management protect fish and habitat. Demolition and restoration is expected to be completed by September, so the river can flow for the first time in more than 50 years. We now turn to Indian Country Today's Deputy Managing Editor, Jordan bennett Begay, who has been tracking COVID-19 in Indian Country. Hello, Jordan. We have COVID-19 updates from five tribes across the country, including takeaways from the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights hearing. Here's a look at the data um, this morning. There are 13,906 positive cases and 568 deaths in the Indian health system. Again, that was a total of 13,906 positive cases and 568 deaths as of July 17th. In Nevada, the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe has eight new cases, giving the tribe a total of 41 cases and two deaths. And on the East Coast of North Carolina, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians reported seven new cases. This brings the tribe's total to 93 cases overall and two deaths. And the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe has, now has a total of 70 cases. And the tribe's da uh, dashboard says, these are cases that are coming from the IHS facility in Fort Eats, North Dakota. And in Arizona, the uh, Colorado River Indian tribe saw 13 more cases, giving the tribe a total of 275 cases and two deaths. And the Navajo Nation saw an increase in 79 cases and two additional deaths, its highest daily total in more than two weeks. And the tribe will be going on another 57 week in lockdown. Mark. What else is going on in Washington, Jordan? So uh, today, this morning, the National Indian Health Board and tribal leaders testified before the U.S. Uh, Commission on Civil Rights, and they talked about COVID-19 in Indian country and the impact of federal broken promises on Native Americans. Um, Fawn Sharp, the president of the National Congress of American Indians and Quinault Nation, said that Indian country requires a public health and e economic recovery plan. Um, some of them like referred to it as the Marshall Plan, um, as it was you know, referred to in Europe. Um, and one panelist and sources I've talked to over the last few months 
said that there has been little to no investment for the public health infrastructure in Indian country, so a recovery plan is, des is desperately needed. Thank you, Jordan Bennett Begay. We'll this be right back. Is Indian country today? is Indian country today. Every Friday, we bring together some of the reporters covering the stories in Indian country. This week, we have Tyler Thomas, executive editor of the Cherokee Phoenix. Tyler earned his bachelor's in journalism from Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communication in 2012, and he's been editor of the Phoenix since December of last year. Welcome, Tyler Thomas. Thank you. We also will hear from Marionette Pember. She is the national correspondent for Indian Country Today and Red, and Red Cliff Ojibwe. She's based in Cincinnati. Welcome, Marionette. Oh, hi, thank you. And we're bringing back Deputy Managing Editor Jordan bennett Begay to join us again. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, Mark. Let's start by COVID-19 and um, we'll start with the Cherokee Nation is seeing an increase in positive cases. And Oklahoma has been a state of contention recently with the governor and the rally from the president. Uh, what's kind of the state right now, Tyler Thomas? Um, we're seeing, in the past week, we've seen a real rise in cases throughout the entire state. Um, and it's also in the region that we're in, the 14 counties of northeastern Oklahoma that make up the Cherokee Nation rise there. In the last seven days, we've seen a 20% increase in the total cases. And we've seen a number of deaths slightly increase too. Um, what kind of gives us hope is that the active cases are kind of remaining at a steady rate, even though we have seen some increase. But um, it's still alarming whenever you're seeing the number of cases that have started to pop up each and every day. Um, this week alone, we had days where we were having 800, 900, even 1,000 new cases per day. And it was very alarming, especially whenever you're seeing that the um, state of Oklahoma is not really being proactive in their response. Um, it is giving us some assurance that the Cherokee Nation administration has been proactive in their approach to uh, combat this pandemic, but um, there is some concern, especially with the recent rise in cases. Well, I'm struck with uh, the governor of Oklahoma not only being an advocate for opening up, but uh, testing positive for the case. And um, he's, a, we should note, a member of a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, what, what was it like? What's kind of the talk of the governor's kind of defiance on um, some of the uh, best practices? I'm not sure why he's um, defying the CDC recommendations and experts' recommendations. Um, it's very concerning. I think he's made it more political than it is a health issue, in my opinion. But you, you would think that it would have hit home with him whenever he tells of himself. But hopefully that as he sees these c cases continue to rise, maybe that will um, get him to move more proactive instead of a reactive response. I thought it was really uh, striking that he actually met with a tribe when he had already tested positive and talked about social distancing when he was uh, potentially spreading the virus. Yeah, exactly. You're not seeing um, a real level of concern there within him with with him or his administration and it it kind of spells to how he's during his whole tenure as governor really and how he's responded to other issues um he's just not he's not real i guess cognizant of the environment or aware 
aspect of his real environment. Jordan Bennett Begay, you get a chance to see this from across the country. And one, uh, as Tyler Thomas mentioned, uh, tribes have been really proactive across the country and far more than states, I would uh, suspect. Um, what are you seeing in terms of the, the big picture with COVID on the ground? I think at this time, a lot of tribes, you know, are exercising their sovereignty, you know, even though like maybe they be in some states where there's not many um, restrictions or preventative measures in place. A lot of tribes um, who have existing borders are closing on those borders and having checkpoints and telling people uh, or the tribal citizens, you can you know, not leave or if you come back in, you're going to get tested. Um, and in some cases, too, I know in some Pueblos, they're even not allowing uh, their own Pueblo citizens who do live outside the Pueblo to not come in because, you know, they are a small community, right? They have, you know, 900, like very few thousands of people in the community. So one person can, you know, start a huge outbreak in a small community in these Pueblos. Um, and some tribes, like the Colville tribes out west, they are, you know, taking extreme measures and closing down their offices in uh, borders for the entire year until December 31st. And so they're really concerned. And, um, and also a lot of tribes are ma making mass a requirement whenever they're out in public and having Navajo Nation is implementing the first of the month uh, grocery store shopping to prevent elders from you know, getting sick themselves. Um, but even with that in mind, it's really interesting to see the whole big picture of the data because even though um, COVID-19 affects a lot of elders, and those who are immune compromised. It's also the big picture I'm seeing is that young people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s are the highest group age group that are affected at this point right now, and sometimes even uh, you know less than 20 years of age. And elders are still affected with there, but not as bad. But it also makes me wonder, you know, are these young people, uh, you know, asymptomatic? Can they be potential carriers? And a lot of times, these young people. Are wanting to help elders so are they you know helping their elders by staying at home or even going out there and trying to go grocery shopping what's the you know what's the uh, I guess the limit right there across the um, country what are you seeing in terms of um, personal protective equipment uh, right now so um, with the hearing this morning uh, with the US Commission on Civil Rights um, then I know Navajo Nation, Jonathan Nez did say that there is a shortage of PPE, um, such as in the beginning, there's a huge shortage, especially they were, a lot of the tribes were trying to call for IHS to create or a uh, national stockpile, but that didn't happen because IHS was so worried about dealing with the pandemic itself. Um, and they kind of missed out on that. And a lot of the tribes across the country were uh, left out of these conversations with the states rather than the states reaching out to the tribes um, about uh, resources and equipment. It was a tribe trying to reach to the states themselves and we, you know, they're left out, they're at the bottom of the list when it comes to PPE. Um, some uh, tribal health facilities are still, have no testing equipment or even if they do have testing equipment, a lot of them are getting false negatives. And so a lot of these communities are now wondering, is this our community even safe at all? Is this even a valid testing equipment? And probably the only one they could have at this point. That's interesting. Um, and I, when we had Admiral Michael Waiki on the uh, show recently, he talked about the shortage of dressing gowns, which is not something you think about immediately across the country. Uh, yes, and it's just um, funds are also like a huge part of the conversation too. Like they were saying this morning, tribes still don't have access to FEMA funds or even um, it took a while to a lot of them to get uh, you know, access to the CARES Act funding also, um, and all of these fundings overall uh, will help tribes um, from what President Nez was saying, or I think maybe Fawn Sharp was saying that they could reach out to private um, companies in order to get more PP and just stock up on resources. Marionette Pembers had some amazing stories this week and uh, uh, two that come to mind, and let me start with this one, is a history of racism in sports. Um, how did that idea come about, Marionette? Well, we began to wonder, you know, what, how did uh, native mascots become a thing? And uh, so I began looking into the history and found that much of it was based on social, you know, pop culture from, if you will, from the late 19th and early 20th century that was really highlighting an Indian who never was. 
Um, you know, when we start thinking about the uh, late 19th century, the population, native population um, was reduced considerably. And also that was a period, as we know, when our rights and our lands were severely reduced. And there, this meme began to emerge in uh, popular culture about uh, sort of a, a nostalgia for quote unquote, the noble savage. And there's even some thought that by kind of elevating um, Native people's ferocity and strength, it was rather excused some um, settler guilt for um, killing for killing so many people. So uh, that uh, inspired um, things like dime novels of the era, which was like a significant source of entertainment, and Buffalo Bill's Wild West shows, where they created sort of a tribeless Indian, roughly based on the Plains Indian, you know, borrowing some elements of those folks' regalia and clothing. And that gave birth to this um, sort of uh, stereotyped uh, representative of all 500 tribes for a lot, the greater part of uh, the American citizenry. So this nostalgia then gave birth to this universal Indian who then thus gave birth to uh, these sports mascots. It was sort of considered a way to inspire um, athletic teams with um, incentive to um, overcome their competitors. Another, uh, I mean, this we see this as a national story, and I know so much of the discussion is about the NFL, but Marinette, you also see this at the local level with high school sports. Maybe talk about that for a minute. Yes, and I actually have a piece coming out later today. Um, and when you speak with at Native advocates are working to, have been working for um, decades to draw attention to this. Uh, high schools in you know, K through 12, they are really the front battle lines for this. Um, for instance, I think there's uh, nationally, there's like over 2000 uh, native inspired um, sports mascot team names in high schools. And here in Ohio, we have the largest number, well over a hundred. And also we have the largest uh, number of teams that uh, use the R word um, for their mascot. So um, I was speaking with Cynthia Connolly, who's uh, of the um, Lake Traverse Band of Odawa, and she lives currently in Cleveland and she's an advocate there. And she mentioned some interesting points that you know, education and the poor curriculum provided to a lot of our students is really underlies this uh, um, el and elevation of this myth, this mythical universal Indian that I referred to earlier. Um, she quoted the illuminative study, which I'm sure you're, I know you're familiar with, um, that was put out by um, um, Crystal Echohawk and and uh, her folks. Um, that really education for Native people regarding Native people in most of our K through 12 schools, it stops uh, at 1900. And we really are not seen um, in a lens of uh, contemporary people. And, and she, Cynthia, um, I think brought up a really excellent point that this contributes then to this ongoing uh, myth of this universal Native uh, noble savage. I want to shift gears, uh, Marinette, and talk to you about another story you've been working on, and that involves uh, Remington and the Navajo Nation. Yes, that was a very interesting story to explore, and it gave me a lot of opportunities to drill down into topics I hadn't yet uh, looked at, uh, such as a sovereign immunity. The Navajo tribe, there was a, a sort of a brief story that first, I think, came out in the Wall Street Journal that the Navajo tribe was looking to buy Remington Arms, which is the oldest um, gun manufacturer in the United States, over well over 200 years old. Um, Remington uh, also is the manufacturer that uh, built the Bush, I think it's called the Bush, uh, uh, I can't exactly remember the name, but it's a, one of these AK-40, AK-15s, one of these automatic rifles that was used actually uh, during the Sandy Hook um, tragedy where, where um, he shot the, so many of the children, the first graders. Um, so they have gone through bankruptcy. Uh, twice. This is their second time at it, uh, going through it. And they, um, apparently one of the attributes of bankruptcy is it can remove a lot of uh, liability issues associated with lawsuits. Um, so they, I sort of heard anonymously that uh, uh, some, in, you know, people in the investment community really felt that Remington was very interested in any kind of an entity that would have sovereign immunity, that that would be a lucrative investment for them. 
And actually arms sales have skyrocketed during the uh, COVID virus uh, period. Uh, and they were also, I think they, they uh, was able to find that the rate of sales um, was, has only reached this level uh, after uh, President Obama was elected because of fears of uh, reduction of, uh, you know, of constitutional, uh, constitutional amendment. Uh, the Second Amendment. So, uh, so people have been buying guns like crazy. Um, and apparently the Navajo tribe uh, was interested in, in acquiring uh, the Remington arms. Um, and they were very, um, uh, they were not very transparent in their proceedings. Um, I had some difficulty finding out information, um, it, but apparently um, that is also in line with uh, these um, agreements that uh, these non-disclosure agreements that investors make with each other when they are potentially acquiring um, a large business like this. Um, so also the Navajo people, many of the citizens, some citizens contacted me and they were concerned about the lack of transparency and concerned with being associated um, with a gun maker that had such a checkered past. They've also, there is, there's a number of lawsuits. There's also a uh, class action lawsuit against Remington involved with faulty triggers on the automatic weapons. So um, we uh, took a, a, a little a deeper look and actually we were uh, fortunate enough to have an anonymous uh, a report leaked to us that really spelled out that uh, sovereign immunity is not does not offer this sort of blanket liability free um, card when when undertaking um, an acquisition of this level. Although the bankruptcy process does often remove a great deal of liability, it doesn't remove everything unless it's specifically spelled out. Um, so there are limits. And also, if a, for instance, if a tribe creates a separate entity to um, acquire um, a company, that entity may not be subject to sovereign immunity. So there were many elements of this acquisition that raised flags, I think. Um, and uh, as I said, I did uh, then uh, listen to the uh, Navajo Nation's um, budget uh, committee meeting and the line, um, the, leg it was the legislation regarding acquisition of Remington Arms, it was just removed from the agenda and there was no discussion about why, or if they were to move forward with what is called due diligence, which would mean that they would, you know, negotiate with Remington and um, talk to them about these various liabilities, if they could be reduced in some way, or if there could be language introduced that would, you know, um, would free the Navajo tribe from liability for these things. So it, it's unclear at this point if it's under, still under consideration, you know, in the future, but um, uh, it did offer, you know, some really interesting opportunities to look at that. The other thing that I find found really compelling um, was that, you know, uh, Native people have a very long relationship with firearms. We had, they had great interest, I think, for early on with uh, settler contact because it could be used in hunting and of course for self-defense. And during, you know, those uh, colonial uh, times, uh, there was actually, you know, th there was a penalty of debt for selling arms to Native people. So it's rather kind of an interesting irony that uh, Native people would go from, you know, being utterly prohibited from owning arms to actually producing them and selling them to others. Great irony, irony there, Marinette. Thank you. And thank you for the due diligence. Uh, I, I want to wrap up with uh, Tyler Thomas and ask you about uh, jurisdiction in Oklahoma. It's always an issue anyway. And now after McGirt, it becomes much more complicated. Uh, what do you think's next in that regard? Well, yesterday the uh, five chiefs and the uh, attorney general both announced that they're going to be working toward a joint um, presentation on legislation to the Congress on how to handle the jurisdictional issues. Um, I think uh, the attorney general is very welcoming to working with the five tribes and they're wanting to work with the state of Oklahoma to kind of get these issues handled for the betterment of the uh, the Cherokee people and the other five tribe citizens, as well as uh, your citizens of Oklahoma. Um, I think it's awesome that um, in general that for Indian country that the U.S. government was held to their word in those treaties and that our sovereignty is recognized and exercised. So that's um, always a win for Cherokee Nation and all of Indian country in um, general. But it's exciting um, and there are a lot of questions to be handled and answered, but um, 
I think you're looking at a quality partnership that will be able to handle those. There, there was some concerns raised that this might be uh, even more complex when it comes to violence against women. H have you heard anything along those lines? I haven't heard anything um, along those lines yet. Um, we had a special roundtable discussion with uh, Chief Hoskin and uh, Justice of the Nation Supreme Court, Stacey Leeds, the other day. And neither one of those um, brought up that topic and their concerns or um, thoughts on the subject. So I think uh, it's a sign that we'll be able to still exercise our power there. Tyler Thomas, thank you. What up, Mark? Marionette Pember, thank you. Miigwech, Mark. And thank you to Jordan Bennett Begay. Yeah, Mark. That's another edition of Indian Country Today. And thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahan. is Indian country today.